northeastern Canada, around the year 1000 AD. A group of 30 Viking warriors pull their boat onto the rocky shoreline of what is today known as St. Lawrence Bay. They have come from Greenland, sailing under the leadership of Thorvald Eriksson. Thorvald is a warrior of great stature with a legendary legacy. Thorvald's father, Eric the Red, had been the first European to establish a permanent settlement in Greenland while under exile from Iceland for the murder of a neighbor. He named his son Thorvald after his own father, a famously hot-headed chieftain who had been banished from Norway after committing a murder himself. Thorvald's brother, Leif Eriksson, had visited these lands the year prior, with his own band of warriors, spending the winter hunkered down somewhere on the St. Lawrence Bay. Leif had returned to Greenland that spring with great bounties of the lumber that grew plentifully in the area, as well as wild crepes. The grapevines that bore these fruit also gave birth to Leif Eriksson's name for the place, Vinland. As they made their way south, heading down the coastline, Leif named the areas he saw after their most notable attributes. Though the locations can only be approximated through available historical sources, the northernmost of these is Helluland, or Flatland, near today's Baffin Island. Further south, Leif found the central forest belt of Labrador, Canada. He named this Markland, meaning forest land. Further south still was Vinland. Leif's penchant for naming lands was something of a family tradition, as his father had given Greenland its name. Though the land is in fact largely not green, as it lies just inside the Arctic Circle. Eric thought naming it Greenland would make it more enticing for prospective settlers. Now, eager to do some naming of his own, Thorvald Eriksson has repeated his brother's journey. As he and his men beach their boats and find their footing on the rocky shores, a collective feeling of excitement and apprehension takes hold of them. The air is cold and crisp, but other than the crashing of the waves, the Vikings are met with an icy, eerie silence. During his winter sojourn in this area, Thorvald's brother Leif and his contingent of men had not encountered any native tribes. But, as there had been in nearly every place the Vikings had been before, they were confident that native peoples of some kind inhabited the area. The Vikings themselves had originated in Scandinavia, in the present-day countries of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. In point of fact, the term Viking, when used to describe a specific people, is a bit of a misnomer. They referred to themselves as Norsemen and would see Viking as a specific facet of their culture. They lived as farmers and herdsmen, subsisting off of a diet of game meat, dense breads, cheeses, yogurt, salmon, and their ubiquitous honey-based intoxicant, mead. Their existences were meager, simple, and difficult. They lived in small villages, composed of family bands and headed by hereditary chieftains. However, in the late 9th century AD, they had begun to intermittently strike out from their lives in their villages in order to raid nearby coastal towns. As time went on, the range in which they conducted their raids expanded. They raided the monasteries and seaside villages of England, Scotland, and Ireland. They raided east into Russia, and as far south as northern Africa. A Viking raid often entailed lightning-fast attacks that swept down upon their victims, taking anything they could of value and killing anyone who posed any serious resistance. These goods might be in the form of foodstuffs, alcohol, livestock, precious metals, often in the form of religious relics, and human beings to be sold into slavery. Raids were conducted under the leadership of war chieftains, whose military might depended not only on their own martial prowess, but their ability to recruit and sustain forces of fighting men. Ascension in Viking society required a warrior to go forth and reap the rewards of pillage and plunder. Thus, the popular image drawn to mind for most in the 21st century is that of a pagan Nordic madman, intent on wreaking death and destruction everywhere he went. The truth, as is usually the case, is far more complex. Vikings were not only preeminent raiders, but incredibly salient businessmen who established and maintained trade routes that covered thousands of miles and lasted hundreds of years. It was trade, in fact, that drove the Vikings to settle such inhospitable places as Greenland, Iceland, and eastern Canada. Here, vast herds of walrus, far larger than any Norsemen had seen on their home shores in northern Europe, 
provided large supplies of not only meat and blubber, but highly prized ivory. It would, in fact, not be until the 14th century when European powers began hunting elephants for ivory and exporting their highly prized tusks back to Europe that the Viking trade in ivory would finally wane. And while many Norsemen hailed pagan gods such as Odin and Thor, this had begun to change starting in the 8th and 9th century when Christian missionaries had begun to visit their homeland. While Thorvald's father had remained a staunch follower of the old pagan ways, his sons Thorvald and Leif actually converted to Christianity. By the year 1050, most Vikings would, in fact, be Christians. However fervent their conversions, though, the Vikings did not view Christianity and violent seafaring as mutually exclusive endeavors. Raiding, especially against non-Christians, carried on unabated long after the bulk of feared and fearsome Norsemen had adopted their new faith. Finding themselves in new lands, as yet untouched by any Christians or Vikings save for his own brother, Thorvald and his men make their initial incursion into the foreboding territory. They are all heavily armed and armored, with spears, axes, swords, shields, helmets, and chainmail. They move down the shoreline and into the trees, scouting for natural resources and any native inhabitants. Those native inhabitants are likely the people known as the Tuli, the ancestors of the modern-day Inuit people. They, too, are relatively recent arrivals to this area, having come eastward from the Alaskan coastline over the course of the last few centuries. Though not a particularly warlike tribe, they are an extremely hardy and stalwart people, more than willing to defend themselves and their homelands. The Vikings have spotted them from their ships and given them the name Skraelings, which etymologists have proclaimed as meaning anything from little men to barbarians to skin wearers due to the animal hide clothing they wore. The Vikings have not, though, had any contact with them as of yet. Now, as Thorvald and his men round a bend on the coastline, the inevitable collision of worlds is at long last realized. They come upon a trio of overturned canoes, which chroniclers of the event will later refer to as skin boats, beached on a stretch of the rocky beach. Beneath each overturned canoe lie three tool men, nine in total, all lost in blissful slumber and the shade and shelter provided by their overturned crafts. Thorvald and his men set upon them at once, killing eight of the men as they attempt to flee. One tool man manages to slip away escaping into the dense forest before meeting the same fate as his comrades beneath the swords and axes of the Viking horde. Seemingly unconcerned with the lone native they had failed to kill, Thorvald and his men begin to ransack through the belongings of the two. They are flush with the thrill of what they see to be a righteous victory and eager to take stock of what goods these newly found people have to offer. The Vikings make their camp for the night on the beach, happy to indulge themselves in a night of revelry after so many long days and nights of hard travel in such unforgiving environs. Only yards from the bodies of the eight tool men whom they have just killed, the Vikings toast each other as conquerors and warriors. The spoils of this new land are readily apparent to them, and they view themselves as so martially superior that the threat of retribution is, if not unthinkable, certainly of little concern to them. Before long, Thorvald and his men, thoroughly exhausted from their travels, and with their bloodlust temporarily satiated, are all sound asleep on the beach. But as they dream of great deeds and promising futures, the lone tool man who had escaped the Viking's ambush is running full speed, through the thickets and meadows, across streams and over hills, back toward his home village. As he runs, he can scarcely make out the trees, rocks, and bushes he must navigate through, as his eyes are blurred with tears of grief and anguish. Finally, he makes it back to the Tool village. The Tool people live in bands of 10 to 20 families situated on or near the coastline. They live in semi-subterranean dugout-style homes in the winter and animal skin tents during the warmer months. As the man runs into camp, the alarm is sounded from lodge to lodge. Eight of their young men are dead, at the hands of these strange, murderous invaders. At first, a mood of surreality prevails over the camp. The news brought in by this lone survivor seems almost unbelievable. Then, as though some great dam has burst, a torrent of emotion sweeps over the village. 
As great cries and lamentations rise up from the women, the men scramble to organize a retributive raid. The two will subsist in this harsh environment by hunting caribou, seals, walrus, and, most predominantly, the bowhead whale. With an average length of 49 to 59 feet, a massive triangular-shaped skull made to bash through thick arctic ice, and a body weight of 60 to 80 tons, a single bowhead whale could sustain a village for months. This, though, required both the weaponry and manpower to accomplish killing such a formidable animal. The tool have developed stout, bone-tipped harpoons to hunt the whales, as well as powerful bows and thick, heavy-set arrows made to cut down the hulking caribou. In addition to being skilled, fearsome hunters, they are also incredibly adept at piloting their canoes through these icy waters and navigating the circuitous coastlines of their homeland. Though they are not as warlike nor ambitious as the Vikings, the Tool are a hardened people who live difficult lives. And as they are about to prove, they are more than capable of exacting revenge on any intruders to their lands who have come to kill their loved ones. Now, the entire village is abuzz, dozens of Thule men crowding into their hunting canoes while more begin to follow the path cut by the young man who had escaped the Vikings' initial ambush. Though their usual pastime is hunting, their intent on this day is, at least in practice, little different. They are venturing out from their village with the intent to kill. They travel overnight, rowing and running with all the focus and ferocity they can muster. Meanwhile, on the same beachhead on which they had slain the sleeping tool men, the Vikings themselves now lie in slumber. It is not until the morning sun begins to peek over the horizon that Thorvald is awakened. But before he can wipe the sleep from his eyes, a cry goes up from one of the Vikings, who stands near the water, looking out towards the bay. Awake, Thorvald, thou and all thy company, if thou wouldst save thy life, and board thy ship with all thy men, and sail with all speed from the land. Thorvald and his men spend a collective, suspended moment staring out at the water, now filled with oncoming canoes full of irate natives. Quickly, though, Thorvald orders the boat put to water, and all the Vikings to pile on board and form a shield wall. The shield wall is a classic Viking tactic, in use since their earliest days in the forests of Norway and Sweden. This involves the warriors forming a solid line with their shields interlocking and covering not only themselves, but the men beside them. As the boat is pushed away from shore, the Vikings hurriedly take their positions in the defensive formation, and not a moment too soon. As the last man locks his shield into place, arrows begin to impact all around them, with the incessant rat-a-tat-tat of a machine gun. For what seems like an eternity, the projectiles fill the air, along with the aggrieved, angry cries of the men who fire them. Thorvald, meanwhile, continuously exhorts his men to hold their formation. Though they have been caught off guard, each one of these experienced warriors is now ready to weather the attack. Within minutes, the Vikings' boat, as well as their shields, are so replete with arrows that they resemble a giant, waterborne porcupine, each carefully crafted arrow carrying with it the promise of an early demise should it find its mark. Finally, after an extended, though unspecified period, the natives estimate themselves to be satisfied with their retribution. The message, they feel, has been made clear. Any intrusion into their lands, or assault upon their people, will be met with resolute violence. As they sail away, the Vikings breathe a collective sigh of relief, especially Thorvald, as he has successfully led his men through a potentially fatal situation. He calls out to his men, checking to see if all on board are indeed unharmed. Miraculously, none of the men have been hit. With the thousands of arrows projecting from their shields, their boat, and floating in the water around them, this seems an impossibility. Then, perhaps upon his deep sigh of relief, Thorvald senses the sharp, stabbing pain of something deep within his chest, and feels something poking him underneath his right arm. Lifting his arm to examine the cause, he is horrified. A native arrow is buried deeply into his armpit, a particularly destructive wound. It is likely that his lungs have been punctured, as well as other vital organs damaged. Death for the young Viking is now all but certain. As the color drains from his face, he begins to collapse, first to his knees, then he is laid on his back by his men. I have been wounded in my armpit, he says, 
An arrow flew in between the gunwale and the shield, below my arm. Here is the shaft, and it will bring me to my end. Though soon to meet his end, Thorvald manages to convey his last directives to these men whom he had traveled so far with, and now would travel no more. I counsel you now to retrace your way with the utmost speed, but me ye shall convey on that headland which seemed to me to offer so pleasant a dwelling place. Thus it may be fulfilled that the truth sprang to my lips when I expressed the wish to abide there for a time. You shall bury me there, and place a cross at my head, and another at my feet, and call it Crossness forever after. This the Vikings did. Though the precise location is not known, it is recorded that Thorvald Eriksson was indeed buried in the cold, hard ground there on that far shore, with one cross at his head and another at his feet. Though he would not live to see it, Thorvald would finally get to name a place of his own. Perhaps, in his last moments, this brought him some measure of comfort. His men, now leaderless and far from their homes, retreat back to the camp where Thorvald's brother Leif had weathered the previous winter. They, too, would hunker down here until they could make their way back to Greenland and report their unfortunate loss, as well as proffer boundless possibilities for what the newly discovered lands might offer. The fight for those lands, though, would be far from over. The Vikings would soon again see the shores of the Canadian coastline, and their interactions with the native inhabitants of those areas would prove both profitable and, oftentimes, incredibly violent. Though the records can be sparse, there are other recorded encounters between the bellicose, business-minded Norsemen and the proud native peoples. And while the tales of intrepid and intrusive Viking warriors clashing with indignant and rightfully infuriated native warriors might not be plentiful, they are certainly palpable. But for now, those accounts, as well as the countless other tales of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns, are other stories for other times. Thank you for tuning into this episode of History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to click like, share this episode with a friend, be sure to subscribe, and if you'd like to support our work, you can click the link below in the description to become a subscriber on Patreon. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.